A very good afternoon to all the participants watching today and welcome, a very warm welcome to all who are watching today in this third technical session of e-workshop on Linux fundamentals. I welcome you all, each and everyone watching today. And I thank you all for bearing with us and for being with us for the past two days. And I hope that you will actively participate in the same way like you have done in the past two days today also and on the other two days to come. And I thank all our participants and I thank all our resource persons also. And today I'm very much delighted to introduce among us, we have Dr. Dhiman Shah. And I would like to introduce Dr. Dhiman Shah, who is the resource person for today, before I hand over the platform to him. Dr. Dhiman Shah. Dr. Dhiman Shah is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at IIT Bilai, where he joined in 2018. Prior to that, he was a visiting scientist at RC Bose Center for Cryptology and Security ISI Kolkata and a research associate at Crypto Research Lab in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Kharagpur. He completed his PhD with a broad area of research encompassing both theoretical and physical aspects of cryptography. As a part of his thesis work, uh, as a part of his thesis, he worked on the crypto analysis of hash function and authenticated ciphers. He has been involved in the analysis of latest cryptographic hash standard that is SHA3. Before joining for his PhD, he worked in the electronic design automation industry for over two years. He completed his MS degree from IIT Kharagpur in 2009 with a thesis on hardware security. He received his BE from NIT Agartala in 2006 and was also awarded the gold medal for computer science and engineering. He has a research group at IIT Bhillai also. The research group is DE dot ci dot pag dot red lab which focuses on both theoretical and practical crypto analysis and also on aspects of system security the mass current research interests are lightweight cryptography symmetric key crypto analysis and fault-based attacks so this is his brief biodata and now i would like to hand over the platforms to dr timan shah Dr. Diman Shah, welcome to our college. Thank you. Thank you, Pushpa. Thank you so much. And well, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here today and to deliver this lecture for one of the iconic institutes in my home state, Tripura, Gartala. And I am really delighted to share the screen with uh, two of my very good batchmates. So I think the audience wouldn't know, but we all passed out from uh, NIT Agartala Tripura Engineering College in 2006. And uh, it's really, really an honor. And thanks, thanks so much for having me here. And uh, let, me, let, me, let me start by sharing my screen. Sure, sure. OK, uh, is it visible? Just let me know. Yes, it is visible. OK, OK, great, great. Thank you. So fine. Uh, so let's start. Uh, once again, uh, today, as you all might have seen, the topic of our discussion is a bit, uh, you know, it's not like nothing, nothing there in the title, right? How, what, there's nothing there in the title. What is it? Some story we are talking about. But actually, uh, it's a very interesting uh, thing that you'll we'll study today. So I have seen the past two uh, lectures by uh, other eminent uh, speakers. And you ha all have been introduced to Linux uh, basics and also the VI editor. I've seen that. And that's a very great thing. First of all, I would like to uh, you know, uh, emphasize the choice of Linux as an operating system because it's open source. And it's very important that we uh, participate in open source uh, projects. And Linux is a very, very wonderful. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, I, I th sometimes like to call it as a marvel. Is a software marvel. It's a great collaborative thing that has come up uh, after so many people. It's not that some single person or a single company is doing it. It's a collaborative effect that we uh, see, and that's great, great. So, with the basic knowledge that you guys have had in the last two lectures, 
today our emphasis will be a bit different we will try to look at an interesting area of computer science and uh, it's a actually an interdisciplinary area and along with that we will see how linux actually interacts and helps us you know do certain things in that area so we will today basically look at certain problems okay so let me uh, first of all share a brief outline so we'll start with the story of Alice and bob and then we'll look at certain problems so i'll not go into these now let's uh, see how the slides unravel so first of all who are these Alice and bob now some of you might have thought uh, if you haven't googled it yet uh, so you might have thought, okay, Alice and Bob, I don't know what this, this uh, some filmy characters may be. But Alice and Bob's are actually very, very popular and they even have a Wikipedia page. You may look it up. Okay. And these characters were actually introduced by three very famous scientists, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir and Leonard Edelman. And they are basically nothing but placeholders. They are, they are like characters which pay, play a part in explaining certain things. Okay. And they're very, very famous. So. I being a researcher in cryptography, uh, I, I don't think I can live without Alice and Bob. Okay, so Alice and Bob are part and parcel of my life. Okay, and for any cryptographic researcher for that matter. So Alice and Bob actually, uh, using Alice and Bob, we will try to put a problem, a very important problem, a problem that encompasses all of us because we being computer scientists, computer engineers, going to be computer engineers, maybe computer enthusiasts. Okay, we all have our digital lives. and these digital lives have certain very fundamental requirements. Okay, and cryptography as a subject caters to that, uh, those requirements. So we'll look into those requirements one by one and we'll try to motivate ourselves that why they are necessary and why it is important to solve these problems and how Linux helps us in looking at these problems up close. You no, know, we'll do some hands-on stuff also. So I hope all of you would also be ready with your uh, laptops along with this, uh, the screen that is being shared live in YouTube. So Alice and Bob, let's put up the story, the story of Alice and Bob. So this is a very, uh, I think these characters are well known to many of you. Most of you who have watched this movie called Despicable Me or Minions. Okay, so I have used them to play the part of Alice and Bob. So this is the setting. Okay, there is a character called Alice. There is a character called Bob. And there's another character which I've not mentioned in the title because this Eve, this other character called Eve is kind of a villain. So I have only kept the hero and heroine in the title and I've left out the villain. Okay. So I, I'm a like peaceful guy. So Alice and Bob and Eve, these are the three characters that are here and they actually want to achieve certain things. So let's see what are these. Okay. So I will start one by one. I'll just give a basic idea that there has to be a communication between Alice and Bob through a channel. The channel that you can see here is an arrow mark. And this channel is not trusted. That means anything that moves through this channel is observable by other people also. Okay, so it's like that. So I think I'll try to give you this uh, particular example that sometimes it might be that you are speaking to your friend. Okay, and you have a code, code, code language which you both understand. And there is another friend whom you don't want to know that you both are going to meet in the evening, right? So this is kind of that kind of a setup. Okay, so Alice and Bob want to communicate and there are certain requirements. We'll go with them one by one, okay, along the course of this uh, full presentation. First, we will first study integrity using Linux and let's see what the problem is, okay. The problem, the first problem that we are studying today is called message integrity, okay. Now integrity, I think all of you know, integrity means something that has to be preserved, okay. It's the, a very important thing. Now what, do, what does one mean by message integrity? Okay, let's see, let's try to see the setting. As I have said, the problem is Alice wants to communicate with Bob. So in this particular case, just uh, consider that Alice wants to send a file to Bob. Now that file has a content in it called Linux. So it's a simple file Alice is sending to Bob. The content of it is Linux. Great. Now that's quite fine. Let's let Alice send it to Bob. What's the problem? But there is a problem. What is that? The problem is Eve. Eve can partially modify the message. Okay, this is the problem that Eve uh, can observe the message and also has the ability to partially modify it. Okay, just try to understand this. So how, so now the problem is Alice wants to send the message to Bob, Eve can partially modify it while it is in transit. So how can Bob know that the message was modified or not? That is a very, very basic problem. Okay, so this is called as message integrity. That is the integrity of the message was preserved or not. 
Okay, Alice is sending a message to Bob, and the message can be partially modified by Eve. Okay, and Bob has the responsibility of detecting whether there is any modification. Fine, great. So with this motivation, let's see what cryptographic solution we have. Okay, fine. The cryptographic solution is cryptographic hash function. Now, before going into this term, big term, cryptographic hash function, three things. Okay, let's try to understand maybe what you know, our basic setting is in our digital lives. Okay, this Alice and Bob scenario is not very special case. You are every day sending messages. Even during this lecture, you might be chatting with someone on WhatsApp, right? So you are sending messages on WhatsApp. You are sending mail to someone. You might have messaged your mom that you will not be available for next one and a half years because you are attending one lecture. Okay, so all this messaging that you did, all this you know, communication that is happening, are they being monitored? Are they being private? Are, are, is anyone observing you? No, how do you know, right? There has to be something that gives us the confidence that, okay, our communication has some guarantees. Okay, it, it, it may be some, no one is observing it. Okay, there are terms to these things. I'm not giving the exact terms, but this is the basic setting and the entire subject of cryptography actually deals with all solving all these problems, these very wonderful problems that are there uh, related to communication in an untrusted network, in an untrusted channel. So now let's get back to the slide. Solution is cryptographic hash function. Let's try to understand what is this cryptographic hash function, such a big complicated looking term. Okay, fine. So a cryptographic hash function can be very simply, okay, I am telling it very simply. There are very nitty gritties. I'll not go into that. I'll not bore you with the details and everything. I'll just try to motivate you, try to inspire you so that maybe you can go back and look into it in details. So what is the input to this function? An arbitrary length. So arbitrary length input, could be arbitrary length input is the input. Then what is the output? The output is a fixed length. Okay, that's interesting. So output is something like 256 bits or 512 bits. Okay, so it's a fixed and short length, but it is fixed. That's important. Okay, now it is recently there are notions of variable also, but we'll not go into that. For, for the time being, let's assume there is a fixed length output only. So this is the setting. Now you try to understand some few properties which are very very easily understandable from the very definition of this function first of all many to one because the input can be of any size output is fixed definitely it's a many to one function that means there will be many inputs which would have the same output it's very simple it is uh, if some of you remember the pigeonhole principle then by that it is easily established because the input space is high output space is small so just uh, for an example you can think that if the input space is around 1000 bits and the output space is around 100 bits, then the input number, total number of messages in the input is 2 to the power 1000, right? And total number of messages in the output is 2 to the power 100, right? That means there will be many messages that will map to the same output, right? So this is the idea of this cryptographic hash function. So it's a many to one function, fine. Now, one very important property is easy to compute. That means the forward direction, this arbitrary length uh, input to fixed length output, this is easy to compute, okay? But difficult to invert. But you cannot invert, you can't go in the other way around easily. It's difficult, it's very hard. By hard means it will take many years to invert it, something like that, okay? The complexity is very high, intractable. So this is some basic, very basic uh, properties of cryptographic hash functions, okay? Now, how are these useful? Okay, um, sir, you are talking about some technical stuff, something, but how is it useful here? How does it help us? Let's see. Let's come to our very own Linux and see what happens okay this is the input linux and the output and the input is to a hash function called md5 okay message digest 5 and the output is this 128 bit thing that you are seeing okay and similarly you have another uh, um, input where this n has been changed to m okay you can see this linux where it is limux and then the output is here. And you can see, you can hardly find any similarity between the outputs. It has almost changed. It is almost random looking, both of them, right? So this is important. Now, if you want to try it, you can actually try it in your own machine. Just write these simple commands, echo, Linux, then the pipe, and MD5 sum. And you will see that you will get this output. So maybe we can we can try it, try it out. I hope my screen is visible. So we'll write echo, then we'll give this input, Linux, and then there is the pipe and MD5 sum. 
okay this is the this is the command md5 sum most probably many or many of you will have this md5 sum uh, there it, it by default it should be there okay that's why i have given a simple command first so when i enter this what happens it gives me this string a217c8f now if i go back to my uh, slide then i can see see 828217c8f it's the same string okay so it's a deterministic function and and I, when I'm giving it, it gives this output. Now I will just change n to m and it gives me some other output. Okay. Now, remember, what are the properties that if I give you this, if you don't know the input, then it's very difficult from this to reach this. And again, it's very difficult from this to reach this. So it's, it's kind of a one-way function. Okay. But it is invertible, but it's difficult to invert. Okay. It's difficult. It's uh, computationally invisible to invert, if I can use that term. Okay. So this is how, so you can understand that means this particular uh, string almost uniquely identifies this string. Okay, Linux can be uniquely identified by this string because if I change anything, this also changes. This is like a mapping, but of course this is not unique because we know that the input is larger in space than the output. So there are many inputs which will map to the same output. That is fine. But even, the, uh, even that still, those inputs are very difficult to come by that is known as the collision okay we will not go into this details again okay so the property is so it's a many to one function that means you have a large space and then a small space so you are mapping like this so this is the hash function so this is the input and this is the output so you are mapping from a large space to a small space and that's why you are achieving this kind of a thing now of course there will be multiple inputs so there will be multiple inputs which will give the same output that is possible this input 1 and it is input 2 okay and this output maybe output output 1 output i something so this is possible but it is very difficult to find such inputs okay that is the thing that is it is known as a collision property so if two inputs give the same output then they are colliding they are known as a collision this is the collision property so for us, collision is difficult to find. That's why for all practical purposes, speaking very practically or for all practical purposes, this string that we are seeing here is actually uniquely identifying this. Okay. But the term unique that I'm using probably is not right, but for all practical purposes, it works. Okay, great. So we now have a hash function. We have used the hash function. The hash function is called message digest 5. It's an old hash function. Nowadays, many new hash functions are there, but for our, uh, just this demonstration it is fine. And we also have used these Linux commands to see how hash functions are working. And you can also use, actually, without using echo also, you can use files. You can take a particular file and you can calculate the MD, MD5 sum of that. So how, what is the command? It is MD5 sum, then the file name, right? That's it. So that is how your, uh, this particular um, hash function is working. Now, how does it help us? Okay. Before we go uh, uh, beyond, I'll just uh, try all of you that today's hands-on, we will actually use something known as OpenSSL. Okay, open SSL is open secure sockets layer. Okay, it's a cryptographic toolkit. So if some of you are doing this session live, you are also trying it out, whatever I'm saying, please install it. Uh, if you, it's already not there, sudo apt install open SSL and see the open SSL version. Uh, if it's installed, then open SSL version will return something, then don't have to install it again. Okay, so install it because in today's hands-on session, we'll be using open SSL, which is a cryptographic toolkit and it actually uh, i'll not go into the details but it does a lot of stuff which you know the entire internet is based on stuff that it can do okay communication between you know web applications and everything lot of lot of things the the internet banking everything everything is uh, you know it can do stuff uh, it, it has got the you know facility to do all those things okay now what we'll do is that now we will do a simple uh, walk through using OpenSSL. So we did MD5 sum now. Now we'll use OpenSSL. Why are you using OpenSSL? Because OpenSSL is something that we'll use for the rest of this lecture. That's why this is the next uh, simple thing that we'll do. Okay. So these are the few commands that we'll uh, write. Okay. Uh, we have already, uh, actually, we have already prepared these files. Okay. So the, just see, we are echoing Linux in file one. So I think you all know this is the redirect output redirection operator, which will put Linux, this LINUX in file one. Then we are copying file one and file two. And then we are echoing Linux, n is changed to m in file three. After that, we are doing OpenSL MD5 file star. So this star is actually interesting thing. It's known as a regular expression. So file star means 
file all the files which start with these four letters and then succeeded by anything they will be taken up for example file one file two file three all belong to this group file star hence when i run this command all these three hashes are calculated md5 sum of file one which is this we have already seen md5 sum of file two again this and md5 sum of file three which is this now interesting thing is though i copied file one and file two both have the same hash value because the content is same the hash value is created on the content the intern in uh, what is inside the file hence they both are same right now let's probably uh, so if you, you want, if you don't believe me let's me run, let me run it here so here we already have these files before i have kept them so what we will do we will do open ssl md5 file star okay great so this see the output you believe me now whatever whatever i had written one bit, again i will reiterate that file 1 and file 2 have the same hash value because we copied file 1 and file 2 they have the same thing so if i open see if I, you have used vi editor let me open vi file 1 see the content is linux i think you can see it and then we have vi file 2 again the content is linux that's why their hashes are same okay and as i said file 3 is limux we have changed n to m so it's hash changed right see it is limux great so this is our small walkthrough using OpenSSL. So all of you, please install this OpenSSL, OpenSSL, Secure Sockets Layer, it's called SSL. I'll not go into the details of this because let's, let's keep it simple and later on uh, interested people can follow up. Okay, so going back to the slides, now what we have, we will go, go to see how this solves the problem that we had, the, so, uh, the solution for Alice and Bob, how it is sol solving the thing. What Alice will do is, Alice will send the hash digest along with the file. So Alice sends this Linux written, this is file one, for example, Linux is written inside the file. Along with that, the hash also she's sending, okay, to Bob. Okay, now if can modify it, for example, if modified it to Linux, okay, but if can only partially modify the thing, he might have modified this, but he could not modify this, okay, just an assumption. And then what happened? Bob gets the file, Bob recalculates the sum. And he finds that the sum has mismatched, right? We know the hash five sum of Linux and Linux are different. If you uh, just see, Linux is this, and uh, Linux is this, and Linux is this, right? We know this. So that is what Bob catches. So Bob can see that the hash is not matching, and the message, hence the message has been modified. So this is how uh, a cryptographic hash function solve the problem of message integrity. Now some of you might argue that, okay, sir, what if he changes this in such a way that uh, whatever he changes here that also is reflected here so those that is a valid statement but it is very difficult to do and for now we are uh, we are assuming that they cannot do arbitrary changes they can do partial some partial changes they can do so by partially say changing these to something make some partial changes matching this is a difficult thing okay that's again a, a cryptographically hard problem but if you still are uncomfortable what alice can do is alice can just put it in our website this hash value and Bob can later go to our website and check. Now, Eve doesn't have the capability of uh, modifying Alice's website. Okay, so Bob can go there and check the hash value, and then also Bob can match. So that 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 is that is not a very uh, concern for us here. Okay, the main thing is that this modification can be detected using the hash value because the hash value almost uniquely identifies the file. So that is how we have Bob who can now detect the message modification. So sometimes hash functions are also known as modification detection codes mdc modification detection codes okay this is something related to coding theory but let's not go into that so this is how we are solved we have solved the first problem right great so any other applications of cryptographic hash functions this was a simple one of course it is a very powerful primitive okay it's it's one of the most versatile cryptographic utilities the hash function the cryptographic hash functions so mo most of you might have heard of bitcoin this blockchain technologies, right? They use something known as Merkle tree hashes and all those things. So they are also uh, rely on hash functions. Okay, so very, very important. Then you might have, some of you might be working on GitHub, right? You are using Git as a version control systems. And if you know, Git uses internally the hash function known as SHA-1, which actually helps it uh, uh, not uh, get take more space. So in Git, if you have two files, which are same in content, then Git will calculate the hash. See, because the content is same, the hash will be same. 
So Git will not save two uh, files for that. It will save only one file and link to it. That is how Git saves space using cryptographic hash functions. Then there is something known as digital signatures, where cryptographic hash functions are very important, play an important role. So digital signatures are something uh, quite similar to our, the signatures we do in day-to-day -day lives. Okay, the signatures we make on our, uh, you know, on uh, on your uh, report card that your parents make, or you are taking some signature from your, uh, you know, supervisors, your teacher, something like that, some permission. So digital signatures are the digital version of that. And today, uh, I don't think we'll have much time to look into this, but we'll have some some idea. And there are many more. I can't list down all of it. But one thing we can do today, because we are studying Linux, we can do we can ask one very basic question about Linux. Okay. So let us explore one this one this one very interesting application of cryptographic hash functions known as password storage. Okay, now this is a very big uh, question that I'll give to you. How does Linux verify your password? So all of you, you know, you log into your Ubuntu or whatever Kali Linux, Fedora, Red Hat, you know, whatever uh, Arc Linux maybe, whatever Linux version uh, means Linux variant you are using. But you have to log in, right? So when logging in, what do you do? you basically plug in your password. Now, how does Linux verify that? Does Linux store it somewhere and then check that, okay, this is same, same password. But that doesn't seem very plausible, right? If Linux stores your password in some file, then someone can open it and see it and then your password is compromised, right? But what, what if that happens? How to protect against that? Okay, for that matter, this question is for everything. How does Gmail verify your password for that matter? Okay, this is a big question, right? And let's try to answer this. So this is a very common uh, login screen for the Ubuntu guys. Okay, so does Linux store your password? Okay, the answer is no, definitely no, a very, very big no. Okay, actually password storage and verification is done through cryptographic hash functions. Okay, now how does it happen? It's very, very, I think you got the idea. Every password will be hashed. So here, this is an image I've taken from the internet. So you store the, uh, this, first of all, when you are registering, Okay, when you are creating your account or you are creating your user in Linux or your account in Gmail, you are giving your password for the first time. That time, the hash is calculated of the password. And this hash is stored in the password store. There is a database of passwords, all passwords it is stored there. Even for your Linux machine, it is done. For your Gmail also, it is done. Every, every place which is account, uh, which, is, which needs an authorization, stores these hashes in passwords. Of course, it does something more than that. This is a very simplified model for you. It does something known as salting. There is some other things that happen, you know, there are some randomizations that happen. But I am keeping it very simple so that you are getting the basic motivation that why we should not store the password. Rather, we can store the hash because as I said, from the hash, you it is very difficult to get back the password. So it is safe to store the hash rather than storing the password. If the hash is compromised, then does it mean the password is compromised? Okay, because reversing it is difficult, computationally infeasible. Okay, now what happens when you enter your password in Ubuntu or Gmail at that time? Again, this hash is calculated of the password. You give hash, the hash is calculated and from the database, the corresponding hash is retrieved and if they match exactly, then you grant the access, otherwise you deny the access. It's very simple, right? So it's very simple technique where cryptographic hash functions are coming in useful that you have uh, a hash function that actually uh, takes the password, hashes it, stores the hash part, password in the database and later on whenever you log in, it retrieves it from there, matches it and based on that it gives you access or not, right? It's very simple. Now let's, let's come back to our Linux, okay. Where does Linux store this hash? So definitely if I have said that Linux is matching the hash, it must be storing it somewhere, okay. So I'll tell you. So this is some, these are some important files for that matter, which are in the slash etc directory. I think uh, yesterday and day before yesterday, you have been given some idea about the Linux file structure. So you might uh, perhaps know about the etc directory. Even if you don't know, it doesn't matter. It is slash etc, in that slash etc, you have passwd, you have shadow and shadow hyphen. These are the three files. The passwd actually has bookkeeping information. It contains the username, uh, then certain user ID, group ID, uh, the place where your home directory is, your uh, bash, your shell, uh, what, which is your shell that you are using, all those things are there. And in the shadow, actually the hash values are there. And a backup is maintained in slash etc slash shadow minus. Okay. 
So let's look, let's let's do the hands-on with these files. Okay, let's see what, what these files have. So let's let me do a LL. Uh, LL means LS minus self. I have made a shortcut for this. So we'll go to etc and we'll see uh, pass wd. This is pass wd. See, this is the file uh, uh, slash etc slash pass wd. And then we have shadow and I'll give shadow star. So that shadow will also come, shadow minus will also come. The, again, the regular expression. So shadow and shadow minus have come because shadow star means anything that is prefixed by shadow and followed by anything else. So both these, see all these files are there. Okay, now let's try to see. See, actually these files will have a lot of information. I'll just open one. Okay, uh, let me see. Yeah, so this C it has got so much, so many things, root, daemon, C root, then root, uh, slash root, okay, all those things. So let's do one thing. Since you guys have, you know, VI, so let's do, let me, let me search my name. See, this is my name here, Sidhiman, right? And this 1000, this is the uh, user ID, X is that it's the st password is stored in a, in the hash there for that. And then it shows my home directory, my, ha my, uh, this, um, the shell that I'm using, the bash shell. I think yesterday only you had talked about the born again shell, bash shell. So these things are there, right? So these are the bookkeeping information, right? Now let's look into the shadow directory. What is there in the shadow? Again, oh, sorry. Shadow, I think I have to give pseudo. So I have to give my privileges. Okay. So see, there are so many things here, right? So again, let me search my name. So see, against my name, this is a big information that is here, right? This is the hash. Let me grab, let me grab it. Okay, let's grab it. So, sorry, to give pseudo. Right, see, pseudo grape. So I've grabbed my name. And what I see is that there's a big, uh, some some random looking number is there. So this is the hash that, that, that Linux is storing. And whenever I am giving my password while entering, it recalculates this hash and then it gets this value here, right? So this is how these things are happening. Okay, this is a very uh, easy way to see that how Linux is storing the hash and that's how the password is being verified. Okay, so I think all of you got the idea and you saw the contents of these files also. Now I'll again say whatever I've shown you is a limited version actually because actually Linux does uh, many other things. It will use a salt, something known as a salt and then it will you know do some derivation and there are certain things it will um, add. It just doesn't directly hash it. It does some more things. Okay, so you may look it up. So here I have shown you a simplified model to for uh, easier understanding. Great. So we have completed our first problem here. That is integrity with Linux, right? So what do we what do you uh, understand from here? That message integrity actually is an important issue whereby we can find out if a message has been modified or not. And if it has been modified, then we can detect it, right? So we saw that Linux was changed to Linux, and then it was easily detectable because of the hash value changed. So using hash, we use it. And these cryptography hash functions have a large usage. They are used in very interesting technologies like blockchain, version control systems, you know. Uh, in fact, the immutability, immutability of blockchains is dependent on that. And then we also saw that how it's very much, very useful for password storage. Okay, so now we move on to the second problem for us, which is privacy. So privacy with Linux. Second problem that we'll study today is message privacy. It is again a very, very fundamental problem. And again, our characters Alice and Bob will come into the picture. And privacy is a very, very fundamental right. In fact, uh, in you, you might have heard about the uh, uh, European laws on GDPR, you know, data protection and all those things. So privacy is a very, very sensitive, inf sensitive thing. Okay. Though nowadays in, in our, uh, in our uh, social media lives, uh, we hardly keep anything private. We share everything. Okay, but when it comes to sensitive data, then we should always be careful 
like banking information and other things so this must be kept private so how does th this kind of things remain private when you are doing a net banking okay or you are exchanging some sensitive information on whatsapp whatsapp tells you right it is end to end encrypted or all those information it gives you so how does it happen and what so this is another fundamental problem the fundamental problem of privacy which cryptography wants to achieve it's a cryptographic goal the message privacy and the next part of this talk is actually going to focus on message privacy which is a very very important issue because uh, message uh, privacy is a cornerstone of our uh, highly digital lives nowadays right and it has to be ensured because the entire e-commerce industry entire banking industry the entire internet for that matter is based on this particular premise that our communication is private okay so fine let's bring alice and bob back Alice again wants to send a message to Bob, but privately. Alice wants to do this privately. This is very important. Remember, the channel is not trusted. If Alice sends the message like that, Eve can observe it. It doesn't remain private. Okay, so that is a problem. How, what should Alice do? The channel is uh, the place through which she has to send the data, but she cannot actually uh, do anything about it because she is uh, Eve is observing. Okay, so there has to be some other way, right? So there has to be a way so that if though she can observe, she doesn't see the actual content which Alice is sending. Rather, she sees something else, some scrambled information, some gibberish, something scrambled she sees, if she's, okay. But when Bob receives it, Bob should be able to understand, okay. So the target is how can Alice communicate with Bob without Eve understanding? Okay, Eve should not understand whatever Eve, Alice and Bob are communicating about, but at the same time, they should be able to communicate, okay, though Eve is observing. So they cannot hide the message from Eve because Eve is there, she is always looking into the channel, she is like, she is the peeping Tom, she is always looking into it, but they have to still exchange information. So you have to encode. I think most of you ha have this experience in your college life so when you have might have sent letters to your loved ones and you did not want your intermediate friend who is sending the message to read what maybe the message was uh, coded, right? So what is the solution? The solution is to twofold actually from the point of view of cryptography. The first is there is the solution is actually encryption. Okay. For data privacy, their solution is cryptographic uh, goal is in, uh, of confidentiality or privacy can be achieved using encryption. And broadly speaking, there are two types of encryption. One is the symmetric key or the private key, sometimes it's called, and the asymmetric key or the public key encryption. Okay. So in today's this uh, particular session, we will try to look into both and we will try to see how we can achieve privacy even in an untrusted channel. Okay. So let's let's see let's see what we can do. First of all, let's look into symmetric key. Okay, the word symmetric here itself gives us an idea that what symmetric means. Actually, symmetric because Alice and Bob have the same key. They have the same key or the same password. That's why they're symmetric. Okay, and you can see here original text. Right, this this image I've taken from the internet. So original or original text is there. Then it is being encrypted. Then there is some scrambled or gibberish data, scrambled data, and then decryption is happening. And there is original text back. That means there is a function being applied here, and the inverse of that function is being applied here, so that whatever was converted can be retrieved back. And both ends are using the same key. Okay. Now just think of this in real life. How can this uh, can map it to something in real life? So I think most of you have stayed in hostels, right? And you might have shared rooms with your hostel mate, with your roommates, right? So what did you do is that you had a single lock, right? And you had a key, copy of the same key, both of you. So you can think of that hostel room being shared by you both as, as an analog, analogy to this. Okay, so one of you would lock the key, lock the room with the key, and the same copy of the key is available with the other person and whenever he or she returns, they can unlock it, right? So encryption can be mapped to locking the lock and decryption can be mapped to unlocking the lock. Okay, so this is the real life scenario. You can map encryption and decryption to and the symmetric here, the thing symmetric comes from the thing that the same key is being used, same copy of the key is being used at both ends. Hence, 
it's symmetric okay so how does it help us so let's do an very interesting experiment with OpenSSL. Okay. So OpenSSL again, as I mentioned you, it's a cryptographic toolkit and we just used it in our integrity check experiment. And uh, now we'll do this hands-on with OpenSSL using uh, our, uh, our uh, terminal. Okay. So all of you, you should, uh, whoever is doing it live should get your uh, terminals ready. And so the first thing, so I have kept these things ready for you so that we can do it a bit faster. So what we have is that we will go back to this, uh, this folder, uh, privacy symmetry, okay, we are in the folder. And now what we are doing is we are trying to create one file. So let's see, great. What we did, what was the command? Echo minus N, hello Bob meet me in front of women's college today bye bye alice okay so this is the message that uh, we are saving in the file called alice.txt okay so this is the message we have saved and we would like to send it so let's uh, see uh, whether this file has been created see this file has been created alice.txt see the time is now it has been created just now alice.txt and let's see uh, how many uh, characters are there so uh, wc uh, minus m ls i think you guys might know about this character called word count this command called word count so you can see this alice.txt has 64 uh, characters okay so the entire thing is 64 characters right and hence we and now proceed with it so we have already seen uh, the file that has been created uh, and we will now see the hex dump of this message so how to do the hex dump so you see there is one, uh, so probably I will just clear my screen here so that I can write something. You can see there is a command give, uh, there is a command that we are going to write now. It is xxd minus c 8 alice dot txt. So let's see what happens. See, this is actually the hex dump, the xxd command, xxd. Okay, this, is, this gives the hex dump. That means it is a hexadecimal. Hex stands for hexadecimal, hexadecimal dump. So everything is here represented by 0 to F. So 0 to 9 and ABCD uh, EF, right? So you can see, and these other, uh, other switches are, for example, C stands for column mode. So you can see it is given in column. In columns it is given, right? And then um, uh, it is given uh, in octets, 8. And then uh, you have uh, the file name, right? Alice.txt. So here you can see uh, on the right hand side, hello Bob, meet me in front of women's college Agartala. This is written, right? This is the uh, readable form of this, whatever is this. And what you see on this part is actually the corresponding hexadecimal uh, values for this. Okay. So every character is actually occupy two hexa. So four eight, okay, four eight, then E is then six five six. C is for L like this. Okay, so this is the hex dump, which is an uh, you know it's an easy way to see the content of a file. Now this is a text file, so we could have done vi also vi alice dot text. Okay, that is fine. We would have seen the same thing. Hello Bob, meet me in front of my scholars. It's fine. But this hex dump is useful when you are dealing with files that are not readable. Okay, this hex dump helps us to see. For example, it's a random file. Okay, and hex dumps will see that it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so we are using the hex dump here, xxd minus c. Okay. Now, if you guys want, we can also do one more thing, xxd minus b. So here we will expand it to uh, binary form minus c8 everything, but it will just give it in instead of uh, hexadecimal, it will give it in binary form. So just see, see this is the binary form. So the first, so see 0000, uh, zero, zero, zero then 0101 zero, one, zero, one, like this it is going. Okay. Then this is for hello, and like this, it is uh, it goes on. Okay, so okay, this is actually the initial character. So see, it is zero 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 one zero zero one zero zero zero. That means zero one zero zero is four, and one zero zero is eight. So see, it is forty eight here, right? See, it's forty eight. So if you expand it, it is zero one zero zero, and eight is one zero zero zero. So you can actually map this. This, this is a binary expansion of this. 
just the binary ex expansion of this entire thing fine so this is just a way to read the files uh, in uh, you guys if you don't know this linux commands this can be useful hex dump whenever you're looking into some interesting files and you want to make sense of them this comes in handy okay now what we'll do is that we will actually try to encrypt okay so what is the idea of encryption so idea is see if you if you remember let's go back to the slide uh, the last slide see what you are doing we are encrypting that means we are transforming the original text to some scrambled data and then decrypting to get back the original text so this there is some function we are applying some algorithm we are applying of course in this small lecture we cannot study any algorithm or go into details for the time being we'll just assume that there is some algorithm and we'll apply this algorithm using open ssl okay so let's see what a, what a particular algorithm can be okay so let's go here and uh, let's try to put this particular uh, line okay open ssl let me write it i just kept it here for easier follow up i'm just clearing the screen and i'm inserting it okay see there are a lot of things here we have to understand it what what are the things we have written so one by one let us see we have first of all we have written open ssl which is our command which is our basic command that i don't think we have, i have to explain again then we have written something aes hyphen 128 hyphen cbc now what is this this is actually the encryption algorithm for the time being don't ask me any other questions aes is an encryption algorithm it is actually the most widely used the most famous encryption algorithm which was made a standard in the year 2000 it is the aes stands for advanced encryption standard okay it is very very popular and in fact now even now as we are speaking in the browser where you are seeing this you actually will be able to see that it is using aes okay right now as we are having this session so this is our encryption algorithm enc algo i'm writing for short to save some time encryption algo right and then we have lot of uh, switches so minus e this is actually for encryption so it is it is telling that encrypt it okay encryption and then what we have we have in that is the input okay and in 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 we have written alice.txt right alice.txt that is our input file so this is our input file alice.txt which is just made then there is out so out we have uh, we have written bob.bin so bin is for binary file uh, you can give some other extensions doesn't matter just for a convention we have written, written and then we have written something like no pad so no pad means it will not pad the data but if it is not a integral multiple it will pad for the for the time being don't ask me what is no pad just think that it is useful for us somehow here though in the actual sense padding is something where uh, uh, so whenever you talk about encryption algorithm it has some size that it supports so if your message is not of the same size then it will pad the message to make it of the same size okay so for example for aes128 the message has to be 128 bits if the message is not 128 bits or a multiple of 128 bits then it will pad it okay so this is how uh, this is what padding so in our case we have given the switch no pad though in this case it will still pad but we have used it okay so these are all the, i think we understand the entire command now the entire open ssl string that we have given this is useful and uh, we have given we have to, uh, we are telling open ssl key encrypt alice.txt using aes128 cbc algorithm and give the output in the bob.bin file okay this is what you have given and when we hit this it will ask us for a password encryption password so this is the password which alice has to share with bob so that bob can decrypt the file this is the common key the key that you shared with your roommate this is that key so for the time being let me give the password that uh, wc agt okay let me give the password wc agt uh, so i gave enter and it is asking me to enter it again so wc agt i have given again and i am entering and it is done actually let's see the files see bob.bin has been created okay it is given some warning don't worry about this we are using a very simplified version of what actually needs to be done so don't worry um, so that we are, it doesn't look too complicated to all of you i am trying to rip off many things so see bob.bin at 1251 which is the current time it has been created and it's the new file 
that we are talking about that has to be actually uh, we have to look into it this is our encrypted file so let's go back to the slide this is our encrypted file this is a scrambled file that means it should look something like this right let's try to open it with vi editor first okay vi bob.bin okay see it looks very you know it's just gibberish right it is exactly something like this there is something like salted written here that is uh, other than that everything looks uh, gibberish right okay let's use our hex dump to see the same so hex dump means xxd minus c sorry minus c8 and then bob dot bin let's see the hex dump you see it's showing the same thing but in our standard hex dump format so you see you cannot make sense of whatever it is there inside it's very random looking information that we can see okay that means we have been successfully able to uh, change it to scrambled form and now this file we can send over the network even though if if sees it even if cannot understand anything from it you will just see some gibberish okay so we will send this information bob.bin over the network to bob okay great now this is done from from uh, uh, the end of alice alice has done alice's job alice has encrypted the file send it to bob now bob's job will be to decrypt it right the same thing we will now give another command so i have written it let me copy it okay so copy it now we will insert it and just before uh, executing it you will see what has changed open asl is like before it is same okay then aes 120 cbc is same same algorithm you are using okay okay in place of minus e we now have minus d that means we want to decrypt the data we don't want to encrypt it we want to decrypt the data right so this is for decryption that means we are undoing whatever whatever alice has done on the other end we are undoing it okay so you are trying to decrypt and then in is in input file is bob.pin because that is the file that has been received from alice or by the network from the network received it was received bob.pin has been received okay and out is bob.txt right so this is the file that bob will actually uh, print out okay so let's let's do this magic okay we have to enter the password without the password you cannot do okay so password was wc agt okay yes it worked and let's see whatever files have been created bob.txt has been created at 1254 which is the current time so this file has been created let's use vi to open it and see it once bob.txt so you see hello bob meet me in the front of women's college today bye bye alice right so this was the message that bob had uh, alice had sent and bob had received it and bechara eve ko kuch pata nahi chala the eve did not get anything right so eve is totally clueless eve can only see this right but eve can also try to decrypt it right eve can try to decrypt it so let's let's play the role of eve once let's see what happens let's play the role of eve once so what we'll do is that we will now give another command for eve okay let's actually it's just one simple thing we'll do let's copy it from here itself okay so we will now run it as eve okay shift insert okay now what we will change we will change the output file from bob.txt to eve.txt right that's the only thing we change it's still minus d decryption input file is still bob.bin that is what if can also see bob.bin if can also see because it was sent over the network so bob.bin if can also see if has received this file she has snooped the network she has observed she has taped the network and got the information okay and now if can run it okay again is wanting the password but if doesn't know the password right so she will give some random thing she will give 1 2 3 4 5 1 2 3 4 5 maybe and it got decrypted right something happened right let's see again the file list see if.txt has been created wow did if was if able to decrypt it that would be very strange because if did not give the right password let's see see if got some random data by decrypting using some wrong password there is some wrong uh, secret information so this is the part where actually this becomes very interesting that you now without the password if can do nothing the password has been shared between them 
both of them know it so they can't open it even if they open it using some random password they get gibberish information not the original data hence it's no problem from the point of view so the problem we have solved from the uh, point of view of uh, alice and uh, so this is one way to do it you can also do it using a key for example aes 128 cbc this 128 it stands for the key size so you can also use a command uh, where without using a password you can use a key okay uh, so that key you can give yourself for that the command will change okay instead of you have to give an additional switch called minus k so you have to give minus k that instead of giving a password can you give your own key in that case you have to generate a random key okay and generating a random key is easy i will show you so this is the command open cell rand okay so open cell rand x16 actually creates a 128 bit key okay so you see open ssl rand stands for random number hex stands for the output this in what form the output will be displayed and then it is 16 bytes that it generates okay 16 bytes means 128 bits so like this you can generate a key then this this is the same key you have to share with alice has to share with bob okay this key has to share to be shared while decrypting again with minus k this has to be given and then it will work okay so i'm not going to the details i think you already understand this is just a some nitty gritties of the protocol okay so let's get back to our slide we now understand how this has happened and uh, so encryption is using OpenSSL. we have used it we, we, we already saw it in the um, this details in our uh, hands-on session so i don't think we have to go through it again and then we have uh, you know, and, and as i said aes is the most famous symmetric key encryption algorithm and even as we speak in this stream yard that we are streaming this also uh, in the browser you can check that aes is being used probably at the end of the lecture i'll show you, i will also show you that okay moving on in decryption you know we know this so we have just the minus d switch for decryption and it, it indicates that the decryption request okay and if does not know the password hence if decryption should fail hence the mission accomplished right so the mission is uh, mission is accomplished here we have been able to achieve the goal of privacy right so before going into asymmetric so you remember our goal was communicating through an untrusted channel privately in the presence of an adversary like eve who can observe our communication and using a cryptographic uh, tool a cryptographic primitive like uh, symmetric key encryption algorithm aes here we have been able to achieve it and we used open ssl to see the demonstration to so see how it how it worked okay next what we will do is we will look into asymmetric key. now things will be a bit complicated but still bear with me it is not that complicated but it is a bit different from what we have seen as of now in asymmetric so an asymmetric key uh, is uh, in symmetric so an asymmetric key actually very intuitively as it seems it has alice and bob have different keys now so it is very uh, the situation is different alice and bob have different keys okay so these different keys actually what happens is alice every user in asymmetric key setting has two keys one is known as the public key and there is known as the pri uh, private key so there is a key generation function through which this public and private keys are generated okay now how do you what do you mean by this public and private key this is like having two keys where the public key is published it is known to everyone but the private key is only known to the particular user from whom it has been manufactured or whom it has been generated so it is by that sense it is called private it has to be kept private you cannot share it with others but the public key can be shared with everyone the very interesting setting in asymmetric okay now when bob and alice wants to communicate again what bob when bob wants to send a message to alice what bob does is since the public key is known it's a public information bob will encrypt the data using the public key and alice will decrypt the data using the private key now since the private key is only known to alice so other than alice no one else can decrypt it okay so this is the setting again i will mention this is asymmetric key alice and bob have different keys here in fact every user has a pair of keys one is the public key and the private key by definition the public key is public it is shared with everyone you can share it there is no no loss of security if you share it 
but the private key has to be private by definition it has to be kept with you and when you communicate with a particular person you use that person's public key to encrypt the data and send it to that person and the person can his, use his or her own private key to decrypt the information since that private key is available only with that intended person no one else who can observe the channel and can uh, you know snoop the data this encrypted data can do anything about it okay they cannot decrypt it but they, they do not have the corresponding private key so this public and private key form a key pair they are form a pair pairing so like i gave you the analogy of roommates what analogy can i give you here what is the real life analogy so i'll tell you real life analogy is very interesting so you might have uh, you might have have this mailbox right the mailbox that you have in your room okay so this mailbox or uh, you know it is some kind of a uh, uh, po the post box you know the post box or the mailbox that you have so everyone knows where the post box is so that is public information the location of the post box your post box is in your apartment in your flat in your home okay and then uh, on the post uh, the post box of the india post india dark that is there in somewhere in you know in agartala it's in post office chomoni okay the big big office that we have there so there we know there is a big, that the location of that so that location is public knowledge but once you give the data inside it once you put the data inside the post box then it becomes private because only the person who has the key to open that post box can open it okay so this is the analogy of asymmetric key with real life so there are two keys necessary one is public knowledge so using the public knowledge you transfer the data to the particular person okay and once it has been transferred once it has been deposited inside then it cannot be opened by anyone else other than the person who has the corresponding key to open it and notice here that the notion of the key is different because this public private is different they are not same they are asymmetric in nature okay everyone has a pair of keys public private using the public key you can send the information to a person using his or her private key the person can uh, uh, decrypt that information so that is how actually this particular analogy works i hope you got it i i really hope that you got it so this real life analogy of asymmetric key cryptography uh, asymmetric key encryption okay so let's again do a hands on with open ssl okay so we will use a function known as rsa so i told you with during the first slide only that alice and bob these characters are introduced by these three famous personalities are uh, on reverse adi shamir and nadelman so they rsa they, they stand for rsa which is the most widely used asymmetric algorithm rsa even as i i was telling about aes what rsa also the same thing applies it is being used everywhere almost everywhere in our browser everywhere that you are talking it is being used so we'll use rsa algorithm we'll not go into the details of how the algorithm works that is beyond the scope of this lecture but interested student can find out but here we will try to do a hands on and see how this uh, private uh, this uh, keys are generated and how this private public keys operate okay so the basic commands are for rsa keys are uh, open ssl gen rsa gen rsa is used to generate the private keys so the private keys are generated and then open ssl rsa this is used to manage the rsa private keys that is you can generate a public key from the private key so the private key is the most important thing the, the public key can be generated from the private key okay so and then you have open ssl rsa utility utl rsa utl which is used to encrypt and decrypt files in um, rsa uh, files with rsa keys okay so we can actually try to uh, see how one uh, small using uh, using some small uh, hands on to see, uh, see how it works so let's go back to our terminal so i'll just clear the screen and change my directory to the asymmetric folder okay so here we have some files previously there so what we are trying to basically uh, do is we will try to see this open ssl things so you see open as this open ssl command is here uh, this is used to generate gen rsa okay so let's copy it and uh, use it here so before going let's try to decipher the particular what we have written again we have written open ssl open ssl which is our command we know it we are familiar with it now then gen rsa we have written so this actually is used for generating keys so key generation is a key generation algorithm 
okay and then we have out out is the file where it will store minus out and we have written private key right private key dot p e m we have written there right and we have written 2048 this is the length of the key okay this is 2048 bit rsa 2048 rsa actually it is also is actually the modulus length uh, but let's not go into the details is 2048 bit rsa just just think about this so we have written this this is the output file where the key will be stored so let's run it okay okay i think i should tell you something there are the the commands that i am showing you here are very simplified commands actual commands need to be used with much more uh, protection so you need to the private keys should not be stored in plain text they must be encrypted because they cannot be compromised if they are compromised then that's very difficult it's a bad thing so whatever i am showing you the disclaimer is don't use them as it is try to find out on the net what is the good practice to use these commands what i am i am showing you here is a ripped up version for simplicity okay this is the disclaimer okay let's run it okay what is the output we got generating rsa private key 2048 bit long modulus two primes and then this is something some characters have been printed let's see uh, it is private key dot pem no let's open it open this file vi private key dot pem so let's first see this file uh, see it has been created now it is 1307 it has been created just now let's open it sorry private key dot pm see this is the private key rsa private key is a big thing let me expand this window maybe a bit yeah see it is a very big private key see such a big private key uh, so this is a begin rsa private key end paris rsa private key between these two uh, delimiters this entire thing is the private key okay from this private key we actually can generate the public key so let's see the public key command from our slide so this is the command for public key let us copy it and then we'll analyze it so shift insert see whatever things we have written let's see again of course open sl we don't need to write rsa is actually for key management that's why this rsa is the algorithm that will be used for uh, the thing then input is uh, minus in is private key dot pem this is the input this is the private key we are giving to generate the uh, public key okay dot pem is a extension is called privacy enhanced mail Uh, you can use dot txt also for that matter. Doesn't matter here much, but this is a particular type of extension for storing these keys. Okay, uh, interested people can look this further into these extensions. So private key dot pem is there, right? And then what we have written? We have written. Uh, so this is our input, right? This is the input, and then we have written pub out. This is the important command. Pub out means give me the public key as output. Pub out minus out. which is output file where you want and we have written public key dot pem again right very simple so basically this is the important command pub out that will generate the public key from the private key generally public keys are smaller in size than the private key let's see let's run this command writing rsa key it has made okay let's do an ll and see whether this public key has been created see it has been created at 1310 so which is just right now let's open it and see what is inside it See, it is much smaller. As I said, public keys are much smaller than private keys. It's a smaller thing. So this is the public key that has been used, and we have generated the public and private keys, right? So let's go back to our slide and just see. See, public key, private key. This has to be there. Uh, this analogy, every one. For example, Alice key generation algorithm, public key, private key. This is what we have done right now. We have not done any encryption. We just generated the keys, and then we will do the encryption part later. okay so now we have the uh, this uh, we have generated both and let's see how we'll do the encryption okay so again we are using our old uh, file alice.txt the same message we'll be using okay let me take it from here and put it in our terminal okay so it has created this uh, particular uh, file so let's see ll alice.txt it has been created right now vi alice.txt see it is there okay i think it has got one due to the pasting it it has got one uh, this let me do a shift g okay so i'll just put it in the same line and edited it right so our file is created now we have to encrypt it let's see what are the details of encryption 
okay so this is the encryption command okay so it is actually excluded this sorry okay so this is the input the um, uh, so open so let's see at the commands the open sl rs so we have written open sl is same we have just using rs a u t l this is the rsa utility okay and then very simple actually this command is self readable we are using minus encrypt right we have used the minus encrypt command and then what we have used we have used minus in key that is the public key okay so this is the public key okay public key dot pm this is what you have used and then uh, the input e we have used is just wait one second so uh, the input that you are using is this pub in 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 all Alice dot text. Okay, so what is the input? The input is Alice dot text, right? So this is what you are using, and uh, this is actually the. Uh, okay, we have not given the output file. That's why it is coming like this. Let's give the output file. Minus out. Let's. Uh, so since we'll uh, send it to Bob, let's make it like previously Bob dot bin. Okay, so it will it will be written to Bob dot bin. Let us do ll Bob dot bin. Sorry. Bob dot bin, right? So see, this has been created just now, thirteen thirteen, right? Let's try to open it. Vi Bob dot bin. See, it is some gibberish, right? Because it's encrypted, right? And then we have used the public key to encrypt it. So this is the so if Alice wants to send data to Bob, Alice has used Bob's public key to encrypt it, and Bob will use his private key to decrypt it. So the pair of keys that we have generated here are actually for Bob's because Alice is wanting to send the data. Of course, here we cannot simulate this thing; it is not on a network or something. But we can uh, look into it like this. Fine. Now uh, we can also use our uh, previous hex dump x x d minus c eight eight Bob dot bin. This is also see it is it shows us the entire gibberish data in the hex dump format. Okay, this also works. And now what we will do is that we will try to decrypt it using the private key of Bob. Okay. So what we have is this. So the uh, see now the I think I don't have to write again. It's decrypt. RSA it will decrypt. Then the key is the private key because the private key has to be used for decryption because this is the asymmetric nature of this algorithm. While decrypting, we have to use the private key. And the input is the uh, bin, the encrypted data that is Bob dot bin, and output is we'll do O U T output is Bob dot txt. This is a readable format. Okay, so it should work, I think. So if I do B I Bob dot txt, then see hello Bob, meet me in front of Women's College today. Bye bye Alice. So it is there. It has been created. And if someone wants to see when Bob dot txt was created. It has been created right now, 1350, right? So we have been able to decrypt the data that was encrypted using Bob's public key, and Bob using his private key could decrypt it. So this is the asymmetric nature. That is why we call it asymmetric, because we use two keys. One is public, another is private. Okay, and they are different. Okay, and everyone has a pair of keys like this. So even all of us here, we should have a pair of keys to communicate using asymmetric key cryptography. Okay, so I think you got the idea about this. And uh, now we'll move to our last problem for today, which is authenticity with Linux. Let's see what is the problem again. So in this private, uh, in this encryption thing, what we did was we ensured that the data was uh, private. Okay, the data was private. This has there is no uh, problem with that. The data has been private. It even if someone can observe it, they cannot make any sense of it, and hence it doesn't harm. So we can use an untrusted network and still share information and be assured that nothing will go wrong. There is a third problem that remains. That is authenticity. What is the problem? Authenticity of the source. Again, 
Eve sends a message to Bob claiming to be Alice. This is the problem. Eve is behaving like an imposter. Eve wants to send a message to Bob claiming to be Alice. That is the main problem here with Eve. So how can Bob verify that the message was from Alice? So how if, see, here no, there is nothing to be for, for privacy. I have received some message. Okay. And the, the message, it is written that it is from Alice. But actually it is Eve that is, uh, that is doing the uh, malicious, malicious thing and behaving like Alice. Okay. So how can Bob verify that the message is from Alice? This is known as the authenticity of the source. The source of the information has to be authenticated. And if it can be authenticated, only then it becomes, uh, then we are solving the problem. Okay. So what is the solution? The solutions are, it's not a single term. It's a, like a many things. Digital signatures, as I mentioned earlier, certificates, certificate authorities. Okay. And there is something known as a root of trust. So for this particular case, for verifying the authenticity of the source, there has to be some root of trust. There, have to, there has to be something that you have to trust. Okay. So actually we will not go much details into this, but I will give you some idea about uh, how these things work, about authenticity of the uh, source. So this digital signatures, actually what happens is that the same thing happens. You use the, instead of public private, you do the opposite thing. So when you send data to someone that you want to authenticate, you sign the data. So you basically use your private key to sign the data. Now, private key is only with you. That means signing is a privileged operation. No one can sign other than the person who has the private key. But verification that if you want to verify the signature, everyone can verify it because it is used using the verification happens with the public key. Signing happens with the private key. Okay. So I think you should uh, be uh, careful with this that private and public that you have written. So public and private keys. So this public and private keys, actually this public will actually influence, uh, will be used for verification and private will be used for signature signing. So once you have signed, then the public key will be used to verify the signature. Okay. This is how authenticity will be used. Authenticity of uh, uh, information will be there. So because since the private key is only with you, if the verification passes, that means you have signed it. So that is authenticity of information. Okay. Now, next thing, uh, let's look into this. Now, what is the certificate, certificate authorities and all these things. Now, when you tell me that this is your signature, how do I know that you are not lying? How do I know that you are not using someone else's signature and telling that this is my signature? Okay. And trying to pass on something to me as uh, yours. Okay. To stop this, we have a mechanism known as certificates. Those certificates actually someone endorses the uh, data. Someone endorses the information that this signature is valid. That is be that will be uh, endorsed by some other authority. Okay. For example, uh, your bank uh, has a copy of your signature. So they know that this signature is valid. So they endorse it. So this is the valid signature. So they match it. Okay. Right. So like this, there is a notion of digital signatures and these digital signatures are actually endorsed. They are certified by some authority known as certified certification or certificate authorities. Okay. So this is a very interesting thing that there are some authorities who will issue certificates and these certificates will have the signatures. Okay. And these signatures will help you establish the authenticity of your information when you are sending data to someone or receiving data to someone to verify all those things. Okay. So this is the mechanism. I'll not go into the details because it's a big thing, but I'll give you a very nice experiment to do. Uh, so let's do this experiment. We'll establish, try to establish a connection with Google. Okay. Using OpenSSL. So, okay. This is a TLS connection. I'll not go into the detail how TLS works and everything, but just use for the time being, just try to use this as your, as this command that is there on your screen. Okay. So I'm copying it and I will try to paste it on the other terminal. Let me clear it out. Okay. So now what we are doing is we are trying to uh, put this, this particular um, command. So what it is written open SSL S underscore client and connect with www.google.com at port 443. Okay. This is the entire command. It's very self explanatory. We are trying to connect, make a connection. Okay, to the to Google. So it's a client server connection. And next, see, whenever I'm running this, so many things got printed on my screen. Okay, 
Many things got printed. Connected. First information is connected. Then depth equal to 2. Global sign root CA. Okay, something is there. Then depth equal to 1. Google Trust Services. Then depth equal to 0. California Mountain View. Google.com. Verify return equal to 1. Then there is something written certificate chain. At 0th level, it is uh, uh, this California Mountain View Google LLC www.google.com at level 1 it is uh, Google Trust Services uh, GTS CA 101 and at the final level it is Google sign root CA uh, global sign like this. So what is this? What are all those things? No, I don't think it makes sense right? But actually what happens is there is a chain of certifying authorities. So for example you got a certificate. So this is your certificate. Who issued it? It was issued by, uh, for example, if you are a student of women's college, it was issued by uh, the head of the department. Shima has issued you. Okay, head of the department has issued. So she is a CA, she is a certifying authority. She has issued you this certificate. Now, who has issued Shima the certificate? Shima, when Shima will issue you this certificate, okay, she will actually certify something. But who has given her the authority to certify? That means there is a chain someone has to issue another certificate to Shima. Maybe the, you know, the education department or the uh, Tripura University has issued the uh, certificate to uh, Shima. And then uh, who has issued the certificate to Tripura University, right? Maybe MHID has issued, okay, the certificate, okay. Or maybe now it is renamed, no, it is the, I think, um, education, Ministry of Education or something like that, right? So, okay, I don't know the short form. Anyway, so this is the, so there is a chain, okay, and but it has to stop somewhere, right? Maybe for MHRD, the government of India issues it, okay? So this is, so government of India here is the root CA, root. This is a root CA. So you can think of it like a graph, okay? This is the root of the graph. So this is the root certifying authority, is the government of India. Then it has issued a certificate to MHRD, MHRD is issued to Tripura University, Tripura is issued to head of the department of uh, IT in uh, Women's College and they have, uh, she has issued it to you, your certificate. So this chain, so the entire chain has to be verified. So this is a verification process and this is what you are seeing in case of Google, there is three levels. First of all is the Google sign, uh, this California, uh, Google LLC, then after that Google Trust Services and after that Google sign root CA. This is the root CA, this is the chain, certificate chain. Okay, this is how it is getting verified. Okay, it's very interesting actually, this is how this entire thing is happening. This authenticity, authenticity the, the fact that we are actually connected to Google is established by this. Whichever website is connecting to us, that is claiming itself to be Google. How do we know? We have to use it, use it like this. And this OpenSL command actually helps us find out that this is how this thing is, this thing is happening. Okay, and then after that there is some certificate and there are some other information. Let's not go into the details. There's too much information for us to digest in this short span of time. But we will look into uh, something. So this is a, this information is only given in this slide. Let's move ahead. So this is the certificate. Okay, we saw now what's in a certificate? How do you know? Okay, how does this certificate uh, help us? Can we uh, know what's inside a certificate? So actually to know this, you have to give a command, this one, open SL. X509 is a format, uh, open SL, X509 minus text, and then we have to give the certificate. Whatever this we saw, no, this entire thing, this entire text, we have to give it, okay. So let's see uh, what happens. Let's put it in our text. So we'll insert, uh, sorry, paste it. So this is our command, and along with it, we have to give this certificate, begin certificate, close certificate, this entire thing. Uh, in this delimiter, we have to give this copy. Okay, and then we have to paste it here. Okay, this is a very big thing, got pasted. And, okay, I think I uh, did something wrong. Okay, let me maybe redo the command. Paste, oh no, no, no. I have to copy the command back, got. Okay, just to get, insert. Okay, now we'll paste the command. Okay, I think now it should work. If it doesn't work, I don't know. Yeah, it worked. So, fine. So, this is the command that has been run. OpenSSL X509 is a format. Then these are the switches, text. We are giving the input as a text and the output is given in the uh, input only, in the, in the standard terminal only. So, the certificate, see it is showing. 
is a certificate and when it is what is the validity of the certificate what is the algorithm used it is google trust services which is the issue issuer of the certificate and the subject is google.com to whom they have issued it the certificate is not valid before november 3rd it is not valid after january 26 2021 so this is the period of validity of this certificate and then there are all the algorithms these are public key that has been used the public key and then there are a lot of other things which we are not ready to understand right now probably later you can look into it and that is how actually you see how we have established connection with google right so what is the summary of all these problems that we have solved so we today we got introduced to these three basic problems of alice and bob and the cryptographic goals okay uh, of this so the problems were one was about privacy of data how to keep the data private okay another was of the integrity how to know that the data has not been tampered with and the third was how to know that the source of information is right is the correct source it is not someone else behaving like someone else as an imposter okay so integrity privacy and authenticity are the fundamental goals cryptography goals which hold the entire internet the entire e-commerce entire banking everything together entire entire uh, our online lives okay and solving these problems we, we today we got a brief idea so remember this is just an introduction you must if you are interested you must go back look deep into what the things are what what how can you implement open ssl is very powerful you should go back and look into open ssl yeah, i can suggest you a book you can look at a book known as serious cryptography uh, by john flip amazon and open ssl uh, is a very great tool uh, you can write c programs using open ssl headers open ssl libraries you can make your own encryption tool decryption tool all those things you can do and security is something which is paramount it cannot be compromised and it has to be looked into that is one of some base, very basic things and it has to be handled with care so here the story of alice bob and linux ends i'll just give you one brief introduction about my research lab that pushpa was talking about in the introduction so the lab here is known as so it is called d.ci.phd.red but it is actually deciphered that is the domain this is the domain name actually if you write it in the address bar of your browser it will take you to the website so this deciphered lab uh, and uh, these are some of my uh, students who have graduated this is ekta who is presently doing a phd in austria austria and the other students have joined the industry or they are waiting because of covid they are not gone to their phd or masters programs some are working in the industry currently these are the people who are working with me uh, some in the phd side by the phd student others are undergraduate students and these are some of the new members who have joined us we work with many labs uh, prominent among these is the isi kolkata tcs innovation labs hyderabad uh, we also work with university of new brunswick canada ntu singapore and university of versailles france and recently we have also been uh, working with philips healthcare we have joined projects with iit delhi and cdec noida as of now and you can look at our publication list from our website deciphered this is the website link http you write http slash slash then deciphered you will go to that website or you can go to the google scholar link to see our th uh, thing these are the few moments of our lab and uh, some of the paper submissions farewell and uh, no all those things so this is ekta and she is in her new lab in austria she has sent us the photos so if you want to join us uh, you can mail your resume to uh, get at the rate d.ci.phd.red or you can also mail me my my email is dhiman at the rate iitbilai.ac.in it is available on our website also currently there are open positions in internships there are six month internships two positions are there in embedded security for 5g and uh, there is also a project associate position that will be advertised which is for uh, two years and uh, it is uh, for a secure usb dongle that we are developing uh, with cdac noida uh, for ministry of information technology so if you are interested anyone is interested to work or interested in the field of cryptography wants to know more they can reach out it's not only that you want to join us anyone who wants to join the field of cryptography and uh, you know interested in linux and all those things and system security everything are interested are welcome this is a picture of the campus that iit bilai is building in its new place presently it's in a temporary campus so i welcome all of you there sometime in future maybe in one year's time one and a half years time it will be ready and then you can all visit us okay probably the pandemic will all be also be gone by then and with this i think i once again thank my uh, very dear friends and batchmates uh, shima and pushpa and all the other organizers for taking this initiative of organizing this very nice webinar and uh, you know it will benefit a lot and i encourage everyone to take up open source please take up open source and adopt linux or unix kind of operating systems to get more control over your environment 
learn better all the nitty gritties, operating systems, concepts, everything. You will learn much better with uh, Linux kind of OS because you will, you will get to do stuff. You will get to experiment and never try to uh, fail to experiment. Try to, you know, uh, corrupt your OS. If you are able to corrupt your OS, you are learning, remember. So I think with that, I will uh, probably uh, end my uh, talk here and thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Dhima. Uh, uh, I mean, like that was really, uh, you know, a story of Alice Bob and Linux. That was computationally a very beautiful story. I should say a technically very beautiful story. And uh, I, I believe our participants would have really enjoyed the session because I have seen an overwhelming, you know, uh, response from our participants. They were really giving us a thumbs up saying that this was a really good presentation and I thank you so much and you know the way you have uh, encouraged our participants in use, using open source that was really uh, you know commendable because many of us are afraid to use open source and uh, we have been trying even in our college also to you know encourage the use of open source but yes we are uh, succeeding but not in a fast paced way because all of our all of them are used to using, uh, you know, Windows, uh, Microsoft okay. Windows. So uh, we are trying and uh, we are succeeding. Somewhat we are succeeding. And you should I keep mean, some marks for people installing in your in your exam. Keep ten marks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is very good. I mean, thank you so much. You have really delivered. I mean, you have delivered the story of Alice Bob and Linux, as you have. Yeah, yeah, we were really thinking what is he going to say because it was a very interesting topic and indeed it was interesting. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much. You, uh, you stay with us. Uh, so this is the end of our third technical session, uh, the third day, third technical Oops. session of e-workshop. Uh, we have actually very less questions because you have elaborated so well. Uh, they don't have doubts. Our participants don't have much doubt. But just uh, one participant has a question, which is a basic question. Okay, so I'll just flash that basic question to you. You'll be able to see it in your screen. So her question okay. is. <laughs> okay, okay. Swap partition size. Okay, okay, okay. Now it is, actually previously it was an issue because it was related to the RAM. Okay, it had to be a fraction of the RAM and all those things. But nowadays, you have so big RAM sizes that this is becoming really irrelevant. So yes. you can use generally. Yeah, there's a there's a formula with the RAM size that mm -hmm. how much uh, swap should be there. So you you guys know right why swap is being used because uh, so the students I think uh, because you have to, you cannot keep the entire information on your RAM right. You have to put you have to swap out information from there. So you keep a special place reserved in your hard disk and dedicated as a swap area. Now, generally, I think it was, I don't exactly remember though it was kind of like twice the RAM size or something like that. But nowadays, uh, you have so good uh, you know, DDR4 and so high performing RAMs, swap area doesn't matter much. Okay. Yeah, but I think the formula, please look it up. There's some formula I, I don't exactly remember, but I, it's a good question though. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. There's one more from the same participant. This is our question. Okay, how much memory? Okay, okay, okay. So, okay, I, I will tell you one thing. This nowadays, no, uh, we hardly remember commands. Okay, the, this question you have asked me, you can just put it in the search bar and uh, you will get it, right? I will, I will give two uh, very important um, uh, advice, okay, advices. That is, try to use the online platforms like Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange, these are very, very good, very good. You should post your information there. You should also help other people. Try to give your data in a proper way. Whatever problem you are facing, installation problem, dependency issue, whatever you are doing, try to do it. This uh, Stack Overflow and then Stack Exchange and other, there are many, I can't even name all of them. Stack Overflow is my favorite. Okay, I also sometimes contribute there. People ask questions. I also try to answer if it is in my field. Okay, so I think you should do this, okay. And uh, regarding space, I think there is something I uh, like disk usage, du minus h or something. But I, I'm really sorry. I if if you ask me this question, I will also Google it right now and find it out. So Google is our uh, temporary memory. It's there. It is like our swap memory. Google. Okay. 
<laughs> we don't keep it in our ram in sachi india thank you so much that was a very honest answer from your end <laughs> thank you i hope our participant is satisfied so we have come to the end of our third technical session and we have come to the end of our third day as well so i would like to thank all the participants for being with us and i hope all of you have been very enriched by today's technical session and we will see you again and please join us in our fourth technical session which will be held at on 7th of december from 12 o'clock till 1:30 and we have a very interesting topic even on monday which will be delivered by mr shumon dev so he is also someone who really delivers and will never be disappointed just like our team answer so thank you each and every one and have a very nice day ahead thank you thank you thank you